seek you and find out what your will for our lives is. And about two weeks later, Sandy came to me and said, I've heard from God, and he told me he wanted me to leave my career. And I said, well, wonderful. Um, he said, but I don't want to leave you because I don't know what, you know, or leave and do something else, and I don't know what God wants us to do. And I said, well, if God wants you to do something, he wants me to do something, and he's already spoken to me. I just felt like that prayer was a confirmation. And I said, so he wants us equally yoked, and so we're going to go out, and we're going to find what God wants. So we did. We prayed. Fast forward, and we began to be, we decided that God wanted us to, to be trained to be missionaries. At that time, we went on the outreach, like a, a crossroads outreach, and during the outreach, we went to the Manila garbage dump and um, during our training phase. And we got off the bus with about 40 other people, and we were to walk through the garbage dump, and I got on the garbage dump and I started walking in and I saw these houses and I saw people and I turned to Sandy and I said, I'm sorry, I have seen enough. I am not going to walk through their front yard and be a gawker. I don't have anything to give them today. I don't know what, you know. And so I walked and went back on the bus. However, Sandy, being the person that he is, he walked on the dump and he began talking to people and sharing with people. And this little girl about four or five years old, came up to him, started swinging on his arm, and he said, she said, are you going to come back and help us? And through his tears, he said to her, I don't know. When Sandy got back on the bus, we were both shaken by that experience. You see, we know God listens and speaks. And so when we came back to the, the United States, we said, okay, God, what was that all about? And, you know, Sandy, after some prayer and seeking and things, he came to me and said, I believe the Lord told me that we're to go to the garbage dump. And once again, being the submissive wife that I am, said, um, no, I don't think so. I'm not too keen on that. I don't have anything to give. You know, I don't have any medical skills. And so, but God challenged me to hear him and to listen to him. And so I went to the Lord, and he spoke to me and gave me his word and his promises. So we arrived to the, to the um, what they call a base, it's called a ministry base, a place where you're supported there. Um, and the, the ministry leaders asked if I would take over the student sponsorship ministry. We hadn't heard anything about that, and I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll, let me pray about that and see what God has to do about me doing that. And if you don't know, God has a real sense of humor, and he said to me, um, out of Isaiah 54, how the barren woman, was to have many children, and her children were to be taught of the Lord. And then in my devotions, he t taught me about the poor being rich in faith. He also reminded me of the scriptures in 113, verse 7 in Psalms, that he, pray he raises the poor from the dust and the ash heap. You see, Sandy and I had no children at this time and weren't planning to have any children. So for God to show me to minister to children, I was overwhelmed. Um, but he said to me that I was to share with children, their parents, and the community how much God's love is there to transform their lives and give them a future. It was our job to, to know God and make him known to those we served. It was our God to tell them that Jesus came to give them life and life more abundantly. We returned to Manila, Philippines in May of 1987 with a commitment to serve for at least two years. We ended up staying for five. Manila is a large Asian city with a blend of old and new structures, old and new forms of transportation, and it's teeming with people. City of Manila alone is home to nearly two million people. Then there are 15 additional cities that radiate out from that core, big urban sprawl, raising the population of Metro Manila to just about 13 million people, perhaps more now. In 1987, on the northwest edge of Manila was a place called Smoky Mountain. The so-called mountain was formed by the accumulation of garbage over a period of about 40 years from all those people. It was called Smoky Mountain because of the decaying waste matter that produced 
spontaneously combusted fires burning constantly. That place was also home to about 15,000 people. They didn't own the land. They didn't pay rent. They were called squatters, derisively. Most of the residents were two-parent families, which surprised us, with two to five children. There were about 3,000 households in that squatter community. A typical home was about 100 square feet or a small bedroom size, about 10 by 10. They constructed those from discarded materials collected from the active dumping site. Most residents earned a meager living searching through piles of garbage and collecting saleable material. We would call that process recycling. They called it scavenging, and the people who called it, again, derisively, were scavengers. So YWAM sent a team of missionaries who were trained in health care to Smoky Mountain in 1984. They worked to, me to meet felt needs to scavengers first, built relationships with them, and then talked to them about the good news of Jesus. Some dressed wounds, treated burns, other treated childhood illnesses with vaccinations and other medicines. Some helped with child care and taught nursing mothers about hygiene and new baby care. YWAM missionaries noticed, however, many school-aged children that were not attending school. They learned that day-to-day -day subsistence living may not allow for buying school uniforms, backpacks, or writing materials. So in 1985, they reached into their own pocket and sponsored 12 children into school. They communicated with their churches, friends, and family. Donations come in, came in, and in 1986, they, do, they sponsored 120 children. In 1987, they sponsored 325 children. When we returned in May of 1987, we settled in and got acquainted with other staff, learned the basic work and survival skills in that area. When the new school year started a month later, we helped distribute uniforms and supplies to each sponsored student and helped them get registered in nearby public schools. Melanie was asked to take over the management of the ministry, as she had said, and we prayed about that. She said yes, but not alone. Melanie had already recognized the need to reorganize the way things were being done. I came alongside to help. We set up computer databases for tracking donated funds, maintained donor lists, individual student records, uniform sizes, and state of health and grade, gender, of course, and the different schools that we were enrolled in and had different uniforms that they wore, different colors, so we had to account for those. Each year we had to change those and order them, so it was, it was not an easy process. We began regular visits with students and parents in their homes. We learned about the effects of malnutrition on student alertness, and we learned the relationship between poor reading skills and the dropout rate. We prayed for food. The representatives of Operation Blessing, a US-based TV ministry, offered a one-year supply of dehydrated foods, and we took that and made that into a breakfast meal that Filipino children would like to eat. I mean, they love spaghetti and they love it for breakfast, they'll have it any time. Or a champarado or some other type of food, and we made that and put the protein in that. Then we bought protein, propane stoves, cooking pots, serving bowls, and started feeding a student starter breakfast to about 300 malnourished sponsored students. Then we learned shopping skills in the lo local market, and with God's provision, we switched over to locally produced f um, food that was produced there, and we bought it from the market. We hired and trained a team of parents to cook and serve the food to targeted students. 
We then rented a house to accommodate the expanded ministry we furnished. The ground floor was um, student tables and chairs. We were able to streamline distribution of school supplies. We provided tutors, plus students helped students with after school assignments. Evenings, our classroom downstairs in our home became a study center for high school and a few post-secondary schools. The house was t continually changed out every morning, afternoon, and evening. But it was a fun thing. We prayed about the illiteracy prob problem. Once again, the Lord provided through the representatives from Operation Blessing. They gave us a brand new classroom set of a phonics-based language learning system targeted to elementary students. Little side note here, in the public schools in the Philippines, all of their classes, all of their programs from grade one, one on up are bilingual. They're, they teach half in English language and half in the national language of Tagalog. The reading and writing systems, the two languages are the same, or quite similar at least. Variations in the alphabet and the way the letters are pronounced, but reading and writing skills that apply to English also apply to Tagalog. Our program helped students develop language art skills in both languages. We did that after their regular school hours, and so we found a set of parents and who were willing to send their children, children willing to come, and we dedicated that service to them. We also added field trips to the zoo as a place to reward for uh, students in the after-school program. We began building bridges with public school teachers and administrators. There, in part of the school system, students were thought to be, by some at least, to be kind of a waste of time and school resources. But they began showing promise. Students who were once labeled as mendicants, derisively, were beginning to be taken seriously. Dropout rates fell and grades improved. Sponsored students began winning awards for the best this, the most that, in their classes. Not just for like 50 kids or 300 kids. It was a huge thing. They also began graduating from elementary and high school. Then we were empowered to start sponsoring a few students in college and trade tech schools and university. Also, the spiritual needs of parents and children were also addressed. In the spring of 1988, I organized a VBS that had about 325 kids or 400 children. Um, the way we could have them all come is that the principal had said that we could use the elementary school, for the entire school for the VBS. And so we used every classroom we could and used every missionary we could to, to do a VBS. That was really the beginning of many children's um, relationship with the Lord and their families being transformed. Parents of some students invited us to teach Bible studies in their humble homes on the dump. Our staff began each day in prayer and we practiced biblical principles in our relationships. We ha also hosted mo many children on Saturdays at the Student Assistance Center to watch Superbook and other Bible animated children and oh, they loved to watch them. Some were in English and some had been um, trans translated into Tagalog, but they loved the animation and they loved the Bible. Children and parents then began attending local churches and hosting and leading Bible studies in increased numbers. We selected 50 of the most exemplary parents from among our sponsored students and they helped us gather report cards from sponsored students in the immediate area of their own, own personal residence. They also alerted us to students who were sick or had troubles at home or had other issues. They helped us to address those, to speak into them, to minister. 
In 1989, 90 and 91, we capped sponsorships at 725 yearly and added 25 sponsorships to qualified students for study in trade school or technology courses or university programs. Early in 1992, we sensed that we needed to train up our replacements. We prayed for guidance and developed a plan on how to train our replacements and to work ourselves out of a job. Living conditions were sometimes not easy, but we adapted. The difficulties were worth the price to see that all that God had done in the lives of so many. God had done something in our lives, though, too. The God-honoring fast of Isaiah 58 that Sandy had been challenged to practice was fruitful. God had similarly challenged me in the manner written about in Isaiah 54, to the childless woman to expand the reaches of her tent because she would host many children and they would influence many nations. God has done a wonderful thing in those children's lives and the family's lives. And thanks to social media, like Facebook and other things, we are still in contact with many of those children who are now adults. Some are leaders and professionals around the world. Some are training up their children. Some are leading churches. Some are doing things that we never dreamed of. One young man is leading the, the ministry that we were part of. God has done a great work. And the one thing that Sandy and I have, have learned is that if you follow God's call, no matter what it is, to go across the street or to work in a, in a school or to work in your community or work across the nations, he will change people's lives and he will change yours. At the end of April 1992, we passed on our responsibilities to the new student sponsorship ministry leaders. We left Smoky Mountain behind and headed off to the next mountain God had given us to climb. May God give his, add his blessing to our words. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sandy and Melanie. It's really interesting that we both lived in Redwood City, a place you guys have never heard of at the same time. And now we're both in Colby. Yeah. The Lord has an interesting sense of humor. Yes, As we transition our worship from being hearers of the word to being doers, here's some ministry-related announcement. A reminder that the electronic ways of helping the church financially is still available to those not yet able to attend. There's a link to both the banking transaction and PayPal at the footer of the website. If you would like to help in a future worship service as an usher or greeter or liturgist, please call the office so you can be added to the rotation. Thank you to you who said yes to today. Helping Paws could use donations of pet food and litter if you're able to help bring the supplies by the church office. If you have uh, some time on Wednesday, either at noon or uh, from five to six in the evening, come by. It's an interesting time to spend with people who come by and get some dog food or cat food or cat litter. And we learn a lot about pets. Work continues on the new parsonage. After closing, the trustees did the following things. And I need a list from Jared, who's not here today. And this week we'll be doing, I still need a list from Jared. If you would like to contact, would like to help, please call the office. Patrick and Abby will be back this weekend. The trustees would like to have some of their essentials moved into the basement of the new parsonage by the end of the week. 
Contact Tracy Mackley or Erica Carter to offer your assistance. Or call the office and Kim will put you in touch with them. It says here that Vacation Bible School will be in two weeks, but I had a message on my computer this week that a Vacation Bible School will not be held this year. Amy is going to close us out with music today. Uh, I would remind you again to fill out your contact paper so that that can be co co collected now by one of our ushers. Thank you for coming today. Paul's telling me I'm not loud enough. Appreciate that, Paul. XXX and the listening audience. I guess we uh, are finishing early, so I hope they have some time fillers. The benediction. May the same spirit that we saw present in the Manila dump 
inspire you this week to follow Christ's lead in doing all the good we can, by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Ha, 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 ha.